Welcome to October, the spookiest month when we bury insecure development practices and hope that the only thing that gets raised is security awareness, which means this week we speak with Cesar Rodriguez from Acurix about cloud environments that know what their configuration should be and are resilient enough to stay that way. In the new segment, we celebrate Halloween week with 25 CV evil volumes you should have patched. We review browser security horror genres from isolation like a cabin in the woods to Chrome invasion plus a puzzle box of IoT and more. We have such sites to show you. Stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news. It's time for Application Security Weekly. Signal Sciences secures the most important web applications, APIs, and microservices of the world's leading companies. Protecting over 7,500 applications and 150 billion production requests per week, Signal Sciences' next-gen WAF and RASP help companies increase security and maintain site reliability without sacrificing velocity, all at the lowest total cost of ownership. Signal Sciences' patented technology protects any application against any attack with integrations into any DevOps toolchain. Signal Sciences, demand more from your WAF. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash signal sciences. With 84% of cyber attacks targeting the application layer, securing your software is more challenging than ever. Synopsys enables DevSecOps with a portfolio of industry-leading tools including Coverity, Black Duck, and Seeker to help you build secure, high-quality software faster. Synopsys is the leader in application security testing. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash synopsis to learn more. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome to Application Security Weekly. This is episode 127, recorded October 26, 2020. I'm your host, Mike Shima. I'm here with Matt Alderman. Hello, Matt. Hello. Happy Monday. Big Ten football's back, but so is the snow in Colorado, so it's nice and cold today. <laughs> Nice and cold. It gets it dips below six degrees for me, and that gets cold. So I don't know how what you're suffering through. Uh, we also have John Kinsella, not speaking not of suffering, but um, <laughs> do you want to introduce our co-host? <laughs> How's it I'm, going, John? I'm not, I'm not suffering. I'm still trying to get off a yawn. Uh, one of us yawned right before we went on air, and I'm still trying to shake it off. Um, but uh, yeah, no, not not suffering. Happy to be here. Happy to have you here. As I uh, try not to yawn while we're on uh, on camera here. Uh-huh. Uh, <clears throat> exactly. Uh, join Amit Berket, co-founder and CEO of Perimeter 81, and our very own Paul Asadorian for a technical deep dive into the problems inherent in legacy VPN technology. Together, they will explore solutions for the modern workforce and how momentum towards perimeterless architecture is helping redefine the future of cybersecurity. Register now by visiting securityweekly.com slash perimeter81. Would you like to have all of your favorite Security Weekly content at your fingertips? Do you want to hear from Sam and Andrea when we have upcoming webcasts and technical trainings? Have a question for one of our illustrious hosts, someone from the Security Weekly team, or wish you could hang with the Security Weekly crew and community? Subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher, sign up for our mailing list, and join our Discord server to stay in the loop on all things Security Weekly. Visit securityweekly.com slash subscribe. Caesar is the head of developer advocacy at Acurix and has spent the last 10 plus years working in the cloud security space, securing both private cloud in the military industry and public cloud in the financial sector. He is passionate about contributing to the developer community through open source projects like TerraScan, through blogs and participating in local meetups. Hello, Caesar. Thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me again today. Should we start yeah, with and, the congratulations it's great to first? Have you Congratulations sure. on the Series A. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, really excited about the Series A and on the on the milestone. 
It's a great milestone because we had you uh, back a couple months ago, um, chance to uh, chat with us. So it's always great to have you back to talk even about more things in the cloud. Because last time we did chat, we were talking about configuring cloud um, baselines and then manually just monitoring, making sure that they don't drift. But now, um, in addition to some great news about Series A funding, you've also got some great news for us in the in the sense of in the spirit of DevOps, bringing the automation to all the things. So let's just dive right in. And if we talk about a self-healing cloud, what exactly do we mean about self-healing? So um, what we mean with self-healing is that your security controls are applied with your workload. And once you, when you're provisioning your infrastructure, yeah, we, we're going to check to make sure that your infrastructure remains consistent with the security controls that you define, but also once it's at runtime, we wanna make sure that any drift is remediated automatically so that your workload is automatically self-healing according to your security controls. So something that we've talked in the past is um, where, where if, if for any reason someone has to touch your cloud environment at runtime to make changes, outside of things like your infrastructure as code, you wanna make sure that you detect that drift and check if the change that it's happening is a good change, meaning that it increases your security posture, or if it's a change that decreases your security posture. So we wanna capture that drift and we wanna do remediation as code so that your, so that your issue is remediated and your code remains the uh, baseline and source of truth of your cloud environment but at the same time, there's some security controls where you want to automatically heal them at runtime because they're really important for your environment. And you know that self-healing those uh, issues uh, would not cause any downstream consequences. You want to make sure uh, with some security controls that, the, that your security remains always consistent and in compliance to what you said. Yeah, now I am a, absolutely a huge fan of automation. If you've done something twice manually, turn it into a shell script. And if then once you start using that shell script, turn it into a, a more proper automation. When we talked last time, it was a, there was a focus on, you know, a read only access to the, the cloud, being able to identify was it that drift from a baseline, be able to have developers receive a merge request and then review it and just basically, um, you know, click that merge manually and just have a little bit of oversight. But now things are changing a little bit. So we do um, have to, you know, I, I, I assume we, we have to go from something like a read-only account to be able to do a, a cloud self-healing. And we're also now just automatically making changes in production, which can sound a little bit scary. So maybe talk us through what are some what are some of the things that might be really obvious or maybe the, the, the should-haves, if you will, of what's a good thing for a cloud to just self-heal, self-correct on in their configuration. So uh, some of the things that I can think of off the top of my head is if you have a requirement, maybe a compliance requirement that all data should be encrypted in transit. So um, that's something that by compliance you have to turn on so you can have some self-healing automatic detection and remediation of that issue if your environment ever becomes out of compliance of that requirement. Some other requirements that I can think of is if you have a requirement that your access logs must be re present and retained for X amount of years. You wanna make sure that that type of requirement is automatically fixed if, if your environment deviates from that requirement, for example. So that makes sense. So these are things that you're, you're saying, you know, like kind of the, the, those must haves to comply with. I'm curious exactly. too, as you, and so when that makes and that makes tons of sense. So when security teams or engineering teams are starting to consider this, what are some of the, the sort of the gray areas that they might encounter? Um, because a, a lot of times security and just engineering in general is about trade-offs. So are there certain things that it is good to have that conversation with the teams to understand, yes, we do want a configuration here, except maybe we do want a couple exceptions? Yeah, so I, so I think the the greatest, the most important thing is understanding what your workload at is and what's the current state of your environment. So um, if you have, a, for example, a database that's unencrypted, maybe it has data that's not sensitive, and you're going to automatically turn this on, you have to take into consideration what are the consequences. 
Um, you don't want to accidentally delete the database or make your application unavailable <laughs> because you're turning this on. So it's really important to understand your workload and understand what are the requirements for that specific workload before um, turning things on that could cause damage to your environment if you're not careful. But even so, it sounds like a lot of this conversation, a lot of the description of this workload can still be part of the code. Because I think that was one of the really exactly. things that one of the things that resonated with us a lot is that what is, you know, describe your environment in Terraform, look at what's different in Terraform, or in this case, you know, document some of the, those changes. So it sounds then like it's a lot of perhaps engineers are kind of, well, actually, let me ask this as, as an open-ended question. Who's really driving this adoption or who do you find to be your primary consumer of this type of self-healing capability? So it's mainly um, the owners of the particular workload. So typically the ops, the dev, developers and operations people, and then they get help from the security team defining what are the policies that are important for the organization that then need to be applied automatically on their workloads. And so, so that does seem to be a common theme that the that engineers are really looking for these tools to make their cloud environment easier to manage. And it just so happens, in a good way, that security is part of the conversation to explain here are some really good baselines. So I'm kind of curious too, um, as you see that, are there ways that um, the developers or the DevOps processes are they changing to accommodate these types of tools? And I'm looking to the sense of just maybe Maybe they're just their software development processes or the way that they're approaching testing or approaching deployment to, to production systems. What, what, what kind of additional benefits are they getting outside of just being able to say, we've got a self-healing cloud, which you know, on its own is still pretty good? <laughs> so, I, so I think the, the most important thing is that if you know that you have security embedded as part of your infrastructure, you're gonna have more confidence in deploying that infrastructure and making it available in a production environment. Um, any changes that you're making, you have the confidence that you have controls in place to ensure that your base security baseline is gonna be <clears throat> tested for um, automatically and automatically fixed if you if you encounter any issues that deviate from your baseline. So it's, it's gonna give you the ability to um, provision faster, have will have less of a need for um, for any type of security review that might slow things down because all of that information is already captured within your code and within the setup of your environment. So yeah. Caesar, now, you, what, oh, sorry, Mike, okay. I was going to say, you know, one of the challenges with automation can be, you know, do you apply a, a fix that reverses something um, that was needed, right? So I think what gets a little challenging in the cloud environment is if somebody goes in and makes a manual change and it breaks policy, is it making a change to the environment to break something that you tried to undo or break, right? So how do you deal with some of those scenarios where, you know, a change was made in production for a very specific reason. It might violate a policy, but it was also needed as part of an emergency. How do you handle that reconciliation with your baseline policies and some of the automation capabilities? Yeah, that's 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 very important that when you're making a change, even on the an emergency, um, it's important if you have automation turned on to fix automatically fix things, you need to turn that turn that off first. And you need to have a really good reason for turning that off. If, if the organization has decided that that was important to begin with. So, um, so that, that's the first step. Uh, if you're making an emergency change, make sure that you understand what are the security controls. And if you have to turn that any of those off for any reason, um, have a good reason for turning that off and do that before you um, start making your change. Otherwise it can cause trouble. Now, is that something pretty easy to do in the platform? Is it a, yeah, for as simple us as like an a, API for request? For us, it's just a check mark. Shut this yeah. Off. Yeah. yeah, for us, it's just a, a check mark, an API request. We have a list of all the policies and the, a list of which ones you turn on with self-healing capability or not. So um, it's it's pick and choose, and it's automatically. And, and, it, and you can easily uh, switch which ones you want to self-heal and which ones you don't want to self-heal. Got it.
Cool. So, and that makes sense. And Matt's really highlighting a good aspect is that, um, you know, overall it's great for security to introduce this type of capability, but if you don't have something in your runbook that's really easy to call it the, you know, the break glass or the emergency um, re response, developers are going to get pretty um, upset quickly, especially if you're causing an outage. I'm curious too then, um, uh, sort of what are, you know, I've been kind of a, doing a little bit of hand waviness, just saying cloud self-healing, but l let's tease that apart a little bit. And are there, you know, what are the particular tech stacks or what are the particular abilities that could actually fall into this type of, of self-healing capabilities? Because one thing you mentioned already was um, a database or data, let's just call them data stores since we are talking about the cloud and yeah. encryption at rest. I'm going to at least cross my fingers and hope that there is something like uh, the notorious S3 buckets keeping them private private, things like that. Um, yep. But what other types of capabilities are here that, that um, people could try to um, set some uh, secure baselines for? Yeah, so for, for us, our initial initial focus was the cloud providers themselves, like anything within AWS that we already supported, making sure that we also support um, a self-healing capability, anything within Azure, GCP, and then going into things like Kubernetes and, and eventually containers, um, automatically patching if uh, we're going to get into that, if that's a, a potential avenue for us to explore with self-healing. So um, we want to expand, expand this capability to all of our offerings. So now what about we when we talked last time, we talked about, uh, you know, remediation as code sort of as this development process, meaning you've got a, a development system that is or developers that are creating and getting ready to push something out and you can inspect the code and say, oh, looks like here, you know, and generated that, that merge request that says here's something that looks like it's diverging from the desired state. This is a little bit different because you are doing runtime. So obviously to self-heal, the, the, the cloud or the, the capability needs access to make the changes. But you could run these either, I guess, independently of each other, or you could run them sort of you know, in, in parallel with each other. How do you see um, you know, teams adopting these approaches? And are they, do, they, do you see them picking up one or the other in terms of we just want to focus on development and we don't want to touch prod because it's sensitive or scary, so to speak, or we don't want to interrupt our development and we do want to have that really prod focused um, type of monitoring how does that look yeah. for it's in, in adoption so so yeah so so it's it's both of them so one is you want to make sure that um, any drift from your infrastructure as code is remediated automatically and for that we use remediation as code where developers get a pull request with the fix for any issues that they in trying to introduce into their code and then at the same time for any security issues that need to be healed automatically, you want to turn that on so that if any of those leak into production or any or anything happens in the production environment or even your dev environment, if you want to, if you have controls that we want to set up in your dev environment that are automatically, that, that need to always be turned on, then you have the self-healing capability. So even if someone is in dev and changing things and poking around and, and turning things off or on or making your S2 buckets public, then you can have the self-healing capability to automatically fix those issues. So yeah, that, that the, so the, then you do have that that good complementary capabilities. I, I'm kind of exactly. curious too, along, uh, as we talk about the, this idea of self-healing, Matt hit that really good good angle of sometimes you know production does need to be changed manually. There could be an emergency, something's broken, something needs to be fixed. Um, but obviously, one of the other reasons for doing this is because of misconfiguration or a vuln that leads to unauthorized access. So, uh, are there particular impl implications to saying? Um, someone compromises the cloud environment and the self-healing um, reacts quickly. So perhaps there's a window of opportunity for the attacker that's been narrowed a bit. But are there additional things that need to be worried about as that you know owner in terms of, am I going to lose information? Am I going to lose detections? Or how should I be rethinking of this from the, my uh, incident response perspective? So from an incident response perspective, you, you need to think about this as, a, as another tool in your toolbox. So if there are things that you know that are gonna affect your incidence response capabilities, like turning logs off, you wanna have that self-healing capability so that if that ever happens in your environment where, you're turn, where someone turn off logs, you are automatically remediating um, that, that issue. And at the same time, you need to have observability within your cloud environment 
so that you know that those logs were turned off for X amount of time. So that's that's something that you definitely need as, as a complementary to the self-healing capabilities. One is having the tool, and the second one is having um, a notification of when, when and what happened, which we do provide on our platform, um, a history of, of what has happened in your environment, but also having alerts saying, hey, this happened at this time. So now you know, hey, locks were turned off for X amount of time. Ah, uh, cool. It, so it sounds, yeah, go ahead, Matt. I was going to say, I mean, I, I'm curious, can I take that one step further? Because if I think about a potential remediation step here is we see something got access and maybe the logs got turned off and you notice that and there's a, a, a time window and then it gets restarted because of the remediation component. But maybe the remediation is drop that instance and spin up another instance to make sure that it hadn't been compromised. I, do you go that far or not really yet? Because sometimes the remediation is change the configuration settings. Sometimes the remediation is maybe I need to deploy a new uh, container or a new service because it might have been uh, compromised. I, I'm curious how far this remediation self-healing process goes. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's where we want to go to. Right now we're focusing on the cloud APIs themselves, but we want to we'll go to uh, a place where we can automatically remediate um, issues within your workload, um, vulnerabilities within your um, runtime environments. So that's that's something where we wanna go to. Got it. So right now, self-healing's really around the configuration of the different cloud services via the APIs, but potentially the ability to uh, address it at, at a runtime side, either at Kubernetes or at a container yep. layer. Yeah, exactly. Got it. So, Caesar, um, you've been working with a, a, a good number of Acurix uh, customers. Is that, that fair to say? Yep. Okay. So, I'm, I'm coming in with another of my non-technical questions here, but I think it's it's interesting in this space. So, um, we've been playing with you know some form of uh, response for at least a decade, right? Uh, there's been historically, customers have been pretty afraid of that. They, you know, wait, you want that thing to automatically modify my firewall or reject packets or restart containers or do all these different things. And it's becoming a lot more um, acceptable over the last few years. You know, you guys are doing this, a few other companies out there doing some form of, um, we'll take care of that for you. Um, the reason I asked about the customers, well, I'm curious from what you've seen as you go out and install this and get feedback from people, um, maybe either from the guys in the ground or from management, there's, there could be some level of um, hesitancy. And and what I'm looking for is to help out our listeners of how do you how do you address that how do you when someone says wow do I really want to let this do this um, are are there tricks or uh, tricks is a bad phrase but it's the right phrase are there ways that you're using <laughs> that you've come up with to um, you know sort of get over those so like how would how would our listeners right now say if they want to introduce this into their environment but someone goes oh my god I don't want to automate this yeah. any thoughts about how you've got over that so far. So we, I, I actually haven't experienced that. What I've experienced with is security teams acknowledging all the problems that they have in the environment and acknowledging that they won't be able to fix it themselves with the resources that they have. So having a tool to um, help them take care of a lot of the backlog issues that they have and empowering uh, development teams and, engineer, and engineers to um, build security into what they're building, I, I think um, it's... That's that's it. Really excites people to, to see this capability. Um, we rather than having pushback to this capability, um, <clears throat> especially um, organizations that are coming off from a non-prem environment where you couldn't really do this for the most part. It really excites them once they're going into the cloud to having this capability where you can automatically enforce security controls. You know exactly where what's your security posture and. Um, an on-premise environment, it's really hard to know if you are in compliance or something or not, because there's not an API to in inspect absolutely everything in your environment. So now you have a capability to do that um, in the cloud. So people are mostly excited about this. Cool. 
Kind of in that same vein, and we, we touched on this a little bit earlier with, um, as well, is do you sort of have a, a crawl, walk, run approach, if you will, of, of how um, teams have been deploying this in the sense of here are the the least controversial or least, quote unquote, you know, call them worrisome changes that could be made into the areas that um, you wish or doing self-healing on more on, on different aspects. And I'm not sure exactly what, what particular policies those might be, but just the sense of the really obvious ones, easy ones, and then the other ones that it's better to have a good conversation about just because they, they're they either concerns um, and just some, some comfort that needs and confidence that needs to be built around this type of capability. Yeah, so so it's, it's organization specific. But typically mm-hmm. anything that's not going to impact your runtime environment, so anything that's not going to delete issue, delete resources or, or modify them in a way that's going to make your environment unavailable are the policies that people start turning on. And then if there are any policies that are more um, destructive, I would say, um, those are ones that they, they need to put together a plan to implement and make make sure that they address any any availability issues or anything that could affect the environment. No, that makes yeah. sense. Leave and the that... leave the invasive ones to the side until you're confident that your <laughs> you uh, your automation is working well, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yeah. Build that. Um. Uh, oh, lost my thought. Um. I was going to ask too. Then we've been talking about a lot about the you know the self healing. Um. Tell us a little bit about. It, and I've kind of alluded to this a little bit. We've got. We. It does mean we do need to go from that read only access into a service account that does have access to make changes. So let's talk about that a little bit in the sense of what is because I would imagine that is a point of call it concern or just um a lot of pointed questions that may come about the difference between some humans that have, call it just hand wavy a little bit, root access to your cloud environment, and now you have a service account with root access to your cloud environment. How do we make sure or how do we build the story to you know, explain that we're not necessarily expanding the attack surface in a way that is introducing unnecessary risk? Yeah, so, so from our perspective, the way that you install it within your system is we don't get access to anything. It's just something running within your environment that can perform these actions and you can reduce the privileges of that service to only heal the the particular policies that you want so it's not an admin policy uh, it's a policy with the minimum privileges required to perform the self-healing capabilities um, on the on the previous question though something that just came to mind is when you're deciding what to where to automatically apply self-heal the other capability that we have is um, our threat threat modeling capability, where you can see your whole environment and what are the issues that are in your environment and which ones would create something that we call a breach path. So a path to mm-hmm. um, breach, potentially breach your system. So those are potentially the policies that you want to automatically heal first, since you know that there could be a potential breach because of the issues that we um, saw when we inspected your environment and when we inspected your infrastructure as code. That, that threat modeling aspect sounds neat. And that's where um, I, I'm going to guess it sounds like I, you know, as, an, as a cloud owner, I could go in and start to add some context to my services. So I could say, here is the Lambda that's talking to this data store and drop on a, you know, this is a data store with high sensitive data, or I really don't want this compromised. And then your path is going to show these are some possible ways into it. Um, or even if there is a change that there was a potential exposure um, because of that change. So is, is that, you know, I'm just kind of repeating back to make sure I have a good understanding of what you're describing. Yep. Yep, exactly. Based on your architecture, these are the ex- potential exposures that we see with the way that you have currently configured your infrastructure. So these are the issues and this is their priority and that can help you make the decision on what should be fixed first and what do you want to self-heal and what do you want to put in your backlog for later. Right. And then the story is to kind of tie that into the other part of the, the question about permissions and access is that rather than having the the super admin account, um, this service account c- could just be dis- you have a complex, perhaps, but a IAM policy that says this is the only things you need because you're only going to self heal in these 
particular capabilities, these particular types of uh, services. So sure, you can have that access, but this is all you need at this particular time rather than a super admin that, yes, of course, should have a, a, you know tied to UB keys, tied to strong, you know, multi-factor authentication. So it's not going to get fish. It's not going to be, you know, some other type of accidental um, leakage of credentials. But it's still hopefully minimizing the, the human error, the, the you know errors that are made under pressure as someone is responding to an outage event or trying to fix something in prod. So hopefully those are additional aspects you've seen that are you know, ways of building that support for a really targeted service account to do these type of actions. Yep, exactly. We want to make we want to make sure that privileges in your environment, including to the services that uh, vendors like us have access in your environment, are have least privilege, so that um, any potential issues from those services as well are are covered, and that your environment remains secure. So also too, so so Matt was um, highlighting a couple interesting aspects about the future, about you know sort of the, I think I would call it the the nuke it from orbit feature in the sense of here's a suspicious change, let's uh, just <laughs> destroy that instance or hold it for a, a deeper forensic inspection, spin up something new and clean. Looking ahead, are there additional capabilities you're looking at? So you know what's the next step after your self healing a cloud? You know self architecting a cloud, something silly like that, um, or, or, you know, perhaps less silly, what, what, what kind of capabilities are you hoping to um, deploy over the next couple months? Yep. So, so like, like I said, expanding upon um, our current capability, which is focused on cloud provider APIs and your Kubernetes configuration, and then going deep into your workload itself. And, and that's something that we're still ide ideating. So we'll have more news in the future on how how this will work and how will, will this help you self heal your runtime environment. So it's coming up in the future. Cool. And, and I guess that's a, a good point too. That's sort of uh, we didn't didn't mean to bury the lead, perhaps, but this idea that we are actually just talking about cloud in general. Because I, I think you were in were focused on AWS, and I was mentioning a lot of AWS services myself. But this isn't limited to specific cloud providers. So this could actually help, you know, hybrid cloud environments. Um, but also possibly, you know, should this be something that uh, you know teams can think of for their own data center employments, their own Kubernetes? Um, you know, outside of the cloud environments, or what are some good ways just to think about um, how robust a capability you know th th they could apply this to for their own systems? Yeah, definitely. If you're running something like Kubernetes within your on-prem environment, that's something that we support with our product right now: scanning of Kubernetes for any security issues, and as well with the with the typical cloud providers. So, so you should think about this capability not only as something that can help you within um, on-prem or public cloud, but that will help you with cloud in general, regardless if you're doing private clouds or public clouds. Cool. Well, it sounds to me like we've gone from uh, remediation as a service to self-healing clouds uh, and a very engineering focused um, with the security team coming up, uh, you know, coming from behind or coming in, in, in support of here are what the good configurations are. So um, it sounds to me like a, a great narrative being built out from this capability. Um, I want to make sure I think, I want to make sure I didn't cut off uh, John or Matt. It, it, possibly someone else had a follow-up question there real quick. Maybe I just misheard. No, I, I, I was going to say, thank goodness Sasha remembered not to give up root privileges. I mean, no root. <laughs> <laughs> The one control that we absolutely have to pay attention to, absolutely. Uh, well, well, Caesar, um, thanks again for coming to visit us. I, I know that you're also um, doing a lot of, you know, writing blog, work on some, you know, TerraScan uh, and, and open source. Any any final things you wanted to plug around um, that community aspect, and, and anything else you're working on that, that's coming up in the next couple of weeks or months? Yeah, so um, check out our website for the latest and greatest um, blog post. Um, we're we're definitely adding new capabilities to TerraScan, so coming up with a really unique feature uh, that we'll be announcing in the next week or two uh, to have more powerful scanning capabilities of Terraform code. So that's coming up um, in the next couple of weeks. Awesome. Well. Thanks again, Caesar. This was a once again a great conversation with, about um, the capabilities that, that you all are building.
Yeah, thank you. Also want to thank uh, Matt and John as well for joining me. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Accurix, visit securityweekly.com slash Accurix. And with that, we're going to take a quick break and return with news of the week. <laughs> 